So I always start by asking, why are we here? Why are you here? What, why are people excited about this topic? Why is visualization so important right now? And there are a few reasons. One is that it works. And when I was researching my book, Good Charts, um, I did a lot of work on the neuroscience and the psychology of this stuff, and it just works. And the easiest way to make that clear is if we imagine my hotel room is on fire and I have to get out, what am I going to do? I'm going to run to the door and I'm going to look at how to get out. And if I see this, I'm not going to get out of the hotel, right? The way the brain processes this is different than the way the brain processes this, okay? We can process this in a different way, which allows us to retain the information better, remember it better, uh, and use it uh, more effectively, okay? That's a stupid example, but it's fun. This is a more common example, and some of you in this room probably have encountered this. I call this statistical sentences. You're all looking at this reading, trying to understand what these, this sentence, uh, this, these paragraphs are saying, um, but I could have just shown it like this, and you can very quickly understand the point of all that information without having to remember a lot of numbers, without having to try to parse the sentence structure, the subjects and the verbs. Okay, so the stuff just works neurologically, biologically, psychologically. This is more important to me than the fact that it works. Uh, it really matters. Okay, it matters to the news business, which I'm in, sort of. Uh, there's just so much data and so much argument going on that we have to um, figure out ways to present to our audiences, and you have to figure out ways to present to your audiences all of this data in a way that is both sensical and effective. At HBR, we've really internalized this, and we get these crazy, dense academic papers, and we want a, a general audience to understand them, so we've really turned our attention to translating those academic papers uh, into visualizations in some cases. This is one I worked on uh, in which we had a great paper that showed how the largest companies in the world shared board members. Uh, and what we're looking at here is sort of the global oligarchy. It's, it's a, a story that can't be told any other way than visually. If you read it, you would be bored in five minutes. But visually, it's really compelling. Okay, uh, people, oh, I skipped one, sorry. People argue with charts more and more now. And I love this example. I don't care about anybody's politics. But you'll see on the left there, I love fossil fuel said the only climate, charge you need, climate change chart you need to see. And that's a flat line, right? Here's what I love about that chart. It's correct. The data is correct. And some people get very mad at this chart. Other people don't. But I had a friend who said, well, it's not wrong, but it's wrong. You know what I mean? And so um, people saw this, and they were outraged. And then they had to come up with other ways that were equally factually correct to sort of create a different sense in their audience, to create a different feeling in their audience with the same data sets, right? So people are arguing in charts. Uh, learning has really benefited, this is sticky, I'm sorry. Learning has really benefited from visualization. I had a hard time understanding machine learning until I came across this site uh, called r2d3.us, which animates and visualizes how machine learning works. I, I encourage anybody to go see it, just to see the ways we can teach our audience complex uh, subjects with visualization. And then if you'll allow me to talk about myself just for a minute, um, because it sort of is pertinent, that's my shoulder. This is an MRI from about three months ago, and that big white thing is a tumor, which is benign, so don't worry. But at the time, I didn't know that. And the doctor showed me this, and I sort of turned gray and worried, and he started talking to me about things like, it's probably nothing. He said something about less than one in 100 chance. He said something, I, I think it was like one in 400,000. I don't remember what he was talking about, because at that point, I was, I was out of it. But I was thinking, you know, I needed to make decisions in that moment, and I was stressed out. And there are a lot of times when we need to make important decisions, we have a lot of data coming at us, uh, and we're stressed, uncomfortable, or just not in a position to make those decisions. And can visualization help us do that? Can we use visualization to ease the mental burden and help us make choices in those moments? And I wish the doctor could have done this for me. I wish he could have said, look, Scott, it's probably nothing, and here's how I'll show it to you. There's 100 people. Of those 100 people, Two of them have what you have. And the chances either of those people have a malignant version of what you have are so small that I'm not even going to show that. And in fact, if I showed you a fa oh, sorry about this. If I showed you, come on, baby. You can do it. If I showed you a 1,000 people, 20 of them would have this, and still none of them would have a malignant version. And in fact, 
we'd probably have to get to about 5,800 people before you found one that had a malignant version of this. This may have calmed me down and helped me make better decisions in that moment. Visualization can be used in these situations as well. Of course, it matters to business, to content marketers, to anybody who has to communicate complex ideas. Um, I'm gonna say this a couple of times. The organizations that invest in visualization will do better than organizations that don't. It's already happening, I see it all the time. And the individuals that invest in getting better at visualizing will do better than individuals who don't, okay? This chart is from Tesla. Everybody knows the car company Tesla. When you buy a Tesla, there's hundreds of sensors on it and you sort of agree to send data to Tesla all of the time. Uh, and what Tesla is doing is basically taking terabytes and terabytes of data, which are useless as data, and visualizing them constantly to find patterns. Uh, and it's having a profound effect on how they market their cars, how they build their cars, and what they do with their cars and their customers. This is a very simple example. All it shows is tire pressure over time on their cars. Right? And so I actually don't even have to say much to you to uh, help you see when people refill their tires or which tire is generally the flattest or any of the trends. But th those are trends you cannot see in data. You can only see them visually. Businesses are increasingly turning to this kind of visualization to make sense uh, of their worlds. Tesla has changed how they engineer their cars based on these kinds of visualizations. I talked to uh, Daryl Morey, the GM of the Houston Rockets. I like basketball, and basketball um, is, for some reason, a, a great area of visualization. And his quote just sort of summed it up for me, is you know, basically saying in this micro competitive microcosm of basketball, if we do this better than the other guys, we will win more games. Uh, Cataline Chiabano is a friend of mine from Paris, and he uh, is the perfect example of the person who invested in his ability to visualize and succeeded because of it. He was a manager at Carlson Wagonlet Travel. He was doing some content marketing, and he had to present to clients on, uh, on uh, travel stress. And uh, he was the first time he was presenting to clients, and this was about the fourth or fifth slide in his deck, and he never got past this in the presentation because it was so captivating. What happened was he was given the, the keys to their database of 80 million travel bookings, and he just started visualizing, looking for patterns, and he saw this, and he thought it was interesting because up until this moment when he, when he showed this at the presentation, everybody at Carlson Wagonlet, which is a very big company, and everybody, all of the clients who were there assumed travel stress was a positive correlation. The more we travel, the more stressed we are. And this was revelatory because it actually doesn't show that. It shows that travel stress normalizes as you travel more. It's still there, but it's not, as, it's not higher. And if you look at the low end, travel stress is all over the place. Nobody had seen this view into this data before. Carlson Wagonlet changed its programs, its stress programs. It changed its uh, interface with clients. They gained new clients because they could address needs they didn't know were there. Very successful. And since then, Cataline has gone on to open his own firm where he's doing this data analysis and visualization for other clients, other uh, um, clients. Uh, another friend of mine, India, who was at the United Way, was, uh, do we have any data analysts here at all, data scientists? So she was a data scientist, and she, she will tell you, she looked down her nose at visualization, said, I'm, I'm a serious data scientist. I do regression analysis. I don't do the pictures, you know? Um, but she was getting nowhere because she was going into the boss's office saying, we should fund this program, and here's my regression analysis with my p-values to show it. And they were, you know, they don't want to hear that, right? So she said, I'll, I'll try to get better. And she did. And what do you know? Her programs got funded. Um, she moved up through the organization and has since left uh, the United Way to do some of the similar work at Facebook. Here's the most important point. We all need to visualize, but if we don't do it well, people will judge our information less credibly. There's research to show this. Very key point, they're not judging you less credibly, they're not judging the presentation less cred credibly, they're judging your information less credibly. And we don't want that, right? If we show somebody something like this in HBR, which is a very academic looking thing, they're not only gonna go, what the hell am I looking at? They're actually gonna start to think, well, is this person trying to pull one over on me? Do I really believe this? Is this information reliable? So we have to learn how to translate this for a lay audience into pictures that people can grasp readily, make sense of, and then have conversations about. Really pull the ideas out. Okay, so hopefully you agree with me that this stuff is important. Um, I like to ask the question, what is a good chart next? 
because I named my book Good Charts. I could have named it Great Charts, The Best Charts, Superior Charts, but I named it Good Charts, and there's sort of a specific reason. So we're gonna talk about what I mean when I say Good Charts. I'm just gonna show a few, take a look at them, tell, you know, don't tell me, but think about whether you think they're Good Charts. I'm just gonna flip through them real quick here. Mm. Come on, right? I have to impress the boss, so I'm gonna tilt it a little, I'm gonna give it the 3D. Come on, right? Yeah, everybody recognizes that one. Okay, so what were you thinking when you were looking at those charts? Two things happen when we're asked to judge charts. They actually happen when we're looking at charts in general. The first thing is we start to turn into grammarians. We start to criticize the structure of the thing and not think so much about the ideas. We think about the color, we think about whether I would have used a bar chart or I can't believe you used an exploded 3D pie chart. Um, you know, we start to think about all of these things that make up the structure instead of the ideas in it. And that's fine, but you know, if, even if I got the structure perfect in all of my charts, if I got perfect grammar, that doesn't mean I get a good chart, right? Perfect grammar does not ensure good results. This is perfect grammar, and it's not a very good result if you read it uh, pretty quickly there. Something else happens, though. That's fun for me because you guys are kind of looking at me. I paused and some people looked at me and then I flashed this and everybody's eyes go there. I can watch everybody do that. You can't stop yourself from doing that. It's called pre-conscious processing. As soon as you see that much dy dynamic information, color, lines, shape, your brain immediately says, I need to know what that is and make sense of it, right? And it's pretty, it is really pretty. But pretty things alone, you know, we, we can do that but sometimes that leads to the eye candy problem. We go, great. What does it mean? And just like candy, you end up with a headache because there's really no nutrition there, right? Pretty things alone do also not make good charts, even though you see a lot of pretty useless charts out there. Um, this is an, uh, a sentence I got as an editor at HBR in a draft. I encourage you to read it. It's actually a gorgeous sentence. It really flows like a river. I would be remiss if at this moment I didn't pause to cogitate on two important matters related to the discussion at hand. It's useless. I edited this to two points, colon. So again, you know, it's pretty, but if it's not giving us any value, why are we doing it, okay? So that doesn't work either. Now I'm not gonna stand up in here and say, don't worry about visual grammar, don't worry about prettiness or anything. There are reasons the chart on the bottom here is probably a better deployment of color than the chart on the top. There are times when you might use the chart on the left here, and times, probably more times when you'd use the one on the right. And there are some golden rules that you just can't break. Anybody know what's wrong with this one? This is categorical data. Executive travel expenses don't go to marketing travel expenses. This should not be a trend line. And you might say that's a ridiculous example. I see this all of the time in board presentations, right? So there are certain rules we just, we can't break because they sort of break our brains a little bit. Um, but something else matters more. And if anybody cares to guess what that is, I'm supposed to be funny now, the person who made these slides put this pause in, and I thought that's funnier than anything I could say, so I just left it. Um, it's context, and that is the core message I have for you today. The first step to making good charts is to understand your context, and all I mean by that is ask yourself before you start, what am I trying to say to whom and where? Right, and that might sound simple, but we're gonna show how we actually don't do this a lot. And I'm gonna start by getting us out of charts for a minute and talk a little bit about photography because photography is a good example of context. We generally don't just walk around clicking. We think about what's in the frame. I know my daughter does. She really plans it out. You know, she's got her food perfect. She's got her smile perfect. Um, so we're always setting our context with photographs. So let's imagine for a minute that this, anybody know this chapel in Switzerland? Beautiful little chapel. Uh, let's imagine it's our data set and the photographer is the data visualizer, right? The photographer is setting the context and making the charts. What am I trying to say to whom and where with this? Am I trying to tell you that this is a beautiful chapel? Now I am, right? All I did was step back, same data set, okay? You don't have to go further and close. You can stay the same distance and get really remarkably different views, okay? And you can even get clever and creative and go inside. So in 10 seconds, we got five different views of that data. So let's bring it back to charts. What am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say that the hipsters are right. Vinyl is back, right? Check it out, look at that trend line, that's awesome. I gotta update, it's actually gone up even more. Watch that 2014 bar. 
because vinyl is dead. All I did was step back a little, right? Same data, just more of it, okay? Different message entirely. If I'm an investor, do I need to know the price of gold and silver? No, I'm probably more interested in volatility of the price. Is my investment going up or down? This kind of does that, but maybe not as well as something like this, which normalizes it to percent gains and losses. Now I can really quickly see silver is a more volatile investment than gold, okay? And one of my uh, favorite examples, because it happened to me, I was all ready to present the chart on the left to the board. I've changed the subject so that I'm keeping our you know, personal data clean, but it's the same idea. I was all ready to present this to the board. This is how our customers buy stuff by time of day. And the guy I was working with said, wait a minute, that time of day is the time of day in the server in New York where the purchase is recorded. I said, uh-oh. Because <laughs> we didn't care about that. We cared about what time it was where the person was who was buying it, right? Which is the one on the right. We had to go back and redo. Now, if I was in IT and I wanted to worry about server load, the one on the left is the right one. But this happens all of the time. We don't think about what our data is. We just take that row or that column, and we click the button, we get the chart, and we say that's what it is, right? Because that's easy. But if we do a little thinking about what am I trying to say, I'm trying to say something about purchase habits of customers, not about uh, servers in New York, okay?